So far, I've talked about writing down a series with a variable and then trying to determine how this new thing is a function. Now I want to flip the direction a bit. What if I already have some function that I know? Is there a way to write this function that I already know in a new way as a series? Consider the geometric series again. Previously, I started with the geometric series and proved within its radius of 1, the series was the same as the function 1 over 1 minus x. However, I could have started with 1 over 1 minus x and asked if there was a series that described this function. There is, the geometric series. And this is the same result. I'm just starting conceptually from a different side. This attitude shift works in general. So far, I've had a power series and then shown you how to establish that it is in fact a function. Series are new ways to define functions. However, I could start with a function and ask whether or not there is a series start on the left conceptually instead of starting on the right. And there is a terminology for this. If I have a function, then there may be a power series which matches up with that function, at least on part of its domain. If there is, it is called the Taylor series for that function. If a function has a Taylor series centered at some point alpha with some positive radius convergence, that is not, not just a one point function, then I say that the function is analytic at that point. If that point is zero, then there is a special term, since Taylor series centered at zero are very common. These are called Maclaurin series. These are the definitions. But all this leads to a question. Which functions actually have Taylor series? Which functions can be represented by a power series? And the answer is very pleasant. Any function in the class C infinity, which is the functions that can be differentiated any number of times, is also analytic, has a Taylor series. Infinitely differentiable is equivalent to analytic. So if I want to look for a Taylor series, I know it will work for any function where any number of derivatives are possible. Thankfully, most of the elementary functions have this property, so I expect most to have Taylor series. That's the conceptual setup. If a function can be described as a series, that is called its Taylor series, and this always works if the function is infinitely differentiable. But how do I do this? Well, a Taylor series has a center point alpha and a coefficient cn. Typically, the center point will be given. I'll try to calculate a Taylor series assuming some center point alpha. Then, all that remains is to calculate the coefficients. If I know the cn, well, then I know everything about the series. So how do I calculate coefficients? Let me show you. I'm going to have to work one by one, starting with a constant coefficient c0. And this one is not too difficult. Look at what happens when I evaluate the series at the center point alpha. All of the powers are now powers of alpha. Sorry, powers of alpha minus alpha, which is just powers of zero. And the only term which doesn't have the zero is the constant term, which I can write separately in this way. And since everything else is zero, c naught is all that is left after evaluating. The first coefficient is exactly the function evaluated at the center point. All right, well now for the second coefficient. I'm now gonna take the derivative of the series, which means deleting the constant term and differentiating everything else with the power rule. Well then I'll do the same thing, I'll evaluate at the center point. When I evaluate at the center point, the new constant term is c1, since that's the constant coefficient of the derivative. And all the remaining power terms have powers of alpha minus alpha, which is powers of zero, so they again all vanish, and that leaves just c1, the c1 coefficient, is the derivative of the function evaluated at the center point. Let me keep going. Now I'll take the second derivative. Well, then I start at n equals 2, since two terms have been removed by two derivatives. The constant term is now 2c2. This 2 comes from the fact that I've taken two derivatives. The original was c2x squared, which became 2c2x and then 2c2. When I evaluate at the center point, again, all higher terms vanish. I'm left with just the constant term, 2c2. So the c2 coefficient is the second derivative evaluated at the center point, but now divided by 2. Now on to the third derivative. Three terms are now gone. The c3x to the 3 term from the original has been differentiated three times, which gives a constant of 6c3. The 6 is from pulling down 3, and then pulling down 2, and then pulling down 1 when I do the derivatives. Everything else is 0 as before, 
Therefore, the C3 coefficient is the third derivative evaluated at the center point divided by 6. I just continue with this pattern. Looking at the fourth derivative, the c4 x to the 4 term will have a 4, a 3, and a 2 pulled down by the power rule, which produces 24 c4 as the new constant. Evaluate it at the center point and remove all the other terms. Therefore, the c4 coefficient is the fourth derivative evaluated at the center point, now divided by 24. If I continue this way, I get a nice pattern. Each coefficient is given by the next derivative of the function evaluated at the center point, but I have to divide by all the constants produced by the derivative. If I start with x to the n, well I pull down n, then n minus 1, then n minus 2, all the way down to 3 and 2 and 1. All of these are multiplied together, therefore this number is just n factorial. I divide by that factorial to give the coefficient. So here is the general form. The nth coefficient cn is the nth derivative of the function evaluated at the center point alpha, divided by n factorial. This lets me write the general form. For any function that is infinitely differentiable at a point alpha, that function has a series centered at alpha with this form. The coefficients are the derivatives of the function evaluated at the center point, divided by factorials. This also provides an algorithm to calculate a Taylor series. I need to find a pattern of the derivatives. I need to evaluate them at the center point, and I put that pattern into this sum notation. I'll give some examples of that process in the next video. One nice thing to point out, all I needed for this was the derivative at the center point. Somehow, knowing all the derivatives of a function at a single point is enough to know the series on a whole domain. That's interesting. Taking the sine function, for example, knowing all the derivatives at zero actually contains all the information needed to construct all the many oscillations of the function, even very far out from zero. A differentiable function can be entirely reconstructed just by knowing all the derivatives at a single point, which is pretty curious. So let me end this video with an important fact. I calculated a series with coefficients based on derivatives and factorials. This, is this the only way to do this? Well, I'm not going to prove it, but it is. It is a fact that if two series with the same center point are equal, then all of their coefficients have to be equal. And this is called uni uniqueness of coefficients. Only one set of coefficients describes each series. This means that the process I described to calculate coefficients produces these unique coefficients. I don't have to worry if there is another system out there that produces different coefficients, but the same function. The coefficients are unique, so once I have an algorithm to find them, I have everything I need for the function as a series.